Okay, so anyway, we're gonna, I know they asked me if I'd talk about some of my experiences, and I'll just give you a little bit of uh, what my background is early on. I learned to fly when I was a senior in college in 1955, and I've been flying ever since, so it's been 60 some years, and uh, probably 30,000 some hours uh, later, here I am still flying, and still flying instructor. And so that's kind of where, the way it started out, and that's, that's what my background is. I flew for Pan Am, I was a teacher, and uh, you know that, I founded the aviation program at Big Bend Community College before I went to work for Pan Am, and then went to work for Pan Am, and, and uh, made them go bankrupt. And uh, they sent me on to United, and after I got United, they went bankrupt, and so forth. So I spent about 28 years with Pan Am, and 29 years with Pan Am, and, and six years with, with United before they said, you're too old, get out of here. Okay, so that's generally speaking about my background is I grew up in Yakima, Washington. Uh, my dad was a Ford dealer in, in Sela, just a little town outside there. Uh, Penguin Ford is still there. And I, in fact, I live in the house I grew up in. And I went, uh, retired and went back there. So my dad was in his 90s and needed a little help. And uh, my mother-in-law was uh, elderly and needed a little help, so we moved back to the area. I like it, I like the people there. <coughs> and we still live there and do a lot of kind of things in that area. In fact, we just finished uh, John Bull sitting there, he's one of the owners. We just finished restoring, completely restoring Piper Cub. And we just haven't flown it yet, but we got it completely restored with wing fuel tanks, a C85 engine with a starter, and uh, uh, grove brakes, and about everything there is, and brand new, new fabric. Okay, so here's what I was gonna, thought I would do. Let's review the history a little bit. The first kinds of flying that was ever done was done way back in the 1700s in France first in hot air balloons. So balloon flight was the first fly. In fact, Ben Franklin saw balloon fly in France. So that's how far it goes back. And they did these things and covered them with, with shellac or whatever so they, would, uh, uh, so they would hold the air and they would burn straw in, in a big, big container underneath and hope the whole thing didn't catch fire and away they would go. And so that was the first flying. In fact, when the, there was a siege of Paris, they sent messages outside of the city in hot air balloons. They sent them out, they would drift out, and, and they would send messages that way. So that was the first kind of flying. The second kind of flying was, was gliders. And autolithanol uh, blew off the dunes in Germany and so forth and proved that that people could hang on to something and fly a little bit like a bird, but they were just gliding down, down the slope. He eventually got a little too high and killed himself. But other than that, uh, that's how that worked. And that's what the Wrights used to prove a concept that how to figure out controls and how much wing area and center gravity and all these other things, they used the first gliders. So gliders were second. And then, of course, came airplanes. Airplanes came along in uh, 1903 with the Wright Brothers flight, and we've been flying airplanes and getting faster and higher and everything else ever since. And then, during World War II, the Germans developed helicopters first and flew them inside the stadium. And then eventually we got helicopters, and uh, uh, helicopters now do all kinds of things, carry huge loads, they carry troops, they do just about everything you can think of including people on power lines that are inspecting power lines and up there for various precision lines and so forth. I have been fortunate enough over the years to get a license in all four of those categories. I have a hot air, well, I have not a hot air balloon license. I have both gas and hot air balloon rating. I've got about 400 hours in balloons, which is not easy to get 400 hours in balloons. I, do, I was actually even a pilot and examiner in hot air balloons in California. I have flown gliders. In fact, uh, I flew mostly in in Australia when I had vacations because I got worse vacations being very junior. And uh, so I'd go to Australia and fly gliders. And I've been fortunate enough to get two 500 kilometer flights in while I was in Australia. So that's, 
and those, at least one of them was over eight hours long. And that's a long time to sit in a glider. But I'll tell you what, it's the most interesting, the most intense flying they've ever done. Because if you're trying to get a long cross country, you've got to concentrate on navigation and getting the thermals and playing those thermals as best you can or you're never going to get around that course. Then of course, when I was in college, I learned to fly. Learned to fly at Boeing Field in Seattle in a Piper J3 Cub. And I actually got my license from first flight until I got the license. It was 10 days. I flew up eight and a half hours a day <laughs> during that time when I was able to get it all in and get it done. Okay. And then a few years ago, after I retired, I was doing some flight instructing in Yakima. And uh, a fellow by the name of Archie Hill had a helicopter service, Yakima helicopter service. And he came to me and he said, why don't you get your helicopter rating and instructing helicopters for me? And I said, well, it's very expensive and I don't think I can justify it. And he said, I'll give you a big break on the use of the helicopter if you get the rating because I can't keep an instructor, it's only part time, and I just can't keep it. So I did, I got a helicopter rating, and I was uh, about two or three hours away from going back to get the instructor rating, and he went out of business with wife and wife and wife, so that kind of put an end of my helicopter flight. Anyway, I thought we'd talk a little bit about each one of these, and I'd tell you a little bit about some of the things that I was able to do as a result. In Hot air ballooning, or ballooning. We had, I was instructing for a flying club in, in uh, Santa Rosa, California, part time because I was also flying for Pan Am and commuting. But it, because in the international flying, we got many more hours in a single day than most domestic pilots did. It wasn't unusual for us to have all of our flying done in 12 to 14 days. And then, so you had quite a, half, half a month off. Uh, and if we were lucky, we could combine trips and get it all done in one big bunch, and then that was all there was, basically all there was to the month. So I had quite a little time off. So I instructed for a, uh, I volunteer instructed for a flying club and worked with them. And one day a young guy came in and said, hey, I took a balloon ride over the weekend. We need to get a balloon. And the first thing I said was, the last thing in the world we need is a dumb blue. <laughs> but, he said, I have arranged for us to go up to Corning, California and take some balloon rides. And uh, so let's go up, a bunch of us go up there. And I said, I think I better go along, make sure they don't do something stupid like buy one. So I went up and went along with them. Guess who promoted the buying the first balloon? Because we went out and we flew. And we flew and we came to trees and we come up over the trees, come to a pond, we'd skip across the pond, come to a fence, over the fence and back down and go across. You could pick leaves off the trees and do all these things. And it was absolutely just the most restful, peaceful flying you could imagine. So we bought a used balloon. They decided I should be the first one to get a rating because I was an instructor. You don't need to be an instructor in balloons, all you need is a commercial balloon license and you go right directly to the commercial balloon license. So anyway, I got to my other rating and I taught people to fly balloons. In fact, most of the people that fly in the Napa Valley, uh, a few years ago at least, uh, were people I had trained. And all of those balloon flights over the wine country and champagne flights early in the morning with the champagne toast. We did a lot of those. And I went to Albuquerque year after year. And then I met a guy from England, who was a, uh, a, a pilot and flew balloons for J&B Rare Scotch Whiskey. He was out in Albuquerque. We got to be good friends. When I would have layovers in London, I'd go out to his house and we'd go out together. And I'd go over there and fly balloons in England. Well, one day he called me up and he said, I've got enough points that I'm in the running for the National English Championship, uh, Balloon Championships. It said, but J&B wants us to do a promotion in Switzerland. Would you come over and take one of the balloons, take it up to Switzerland, and fly for me and place me in Switzerland? So I had two friends and I that went over. We picked up his balloon in a pickup, 
drove over to the channel, took the hovercraft across the channel, drove up the, up, uh, the ride to Switzerland to the uh, city of Voland, which was celebrating its 800th anniversary in the town. And we did a balloon uh, promotion there in the town. The first flight we did was right in the town. We'd lift off out of the, the center of the streets, and then we did all sorts of things there for weekend. It was wonderful. And then every year I went down to Albuquerque and flew in Albuquerque. And I've been fortunate enough to have a chance to fly uh, in various other places as well. But the interesting thing was uh, Malcolm Forbes, who I'm sure you've all heard of, was a big balloonist. He was a big, big in ballooning. And we flew in the, the uh, anniversary, uh, 75th anniversary of the of the uh, Declaration of Independence at Reno one year. And there's a bunch of us in our beat up old balloon, which is about ready to fall apart, and a beat up old pickup that we hauled around in. And we got it laid out there with a handmade uh, starter fan to, to it, blow it up in the air so we could get heat into it. And up drives this big semi all painted up and these guys get out in pinstripe uh, jumpsuits all fancy and who's the head of the group? Malcolm Forbes. And they're laying there a fancy balloon out right next to our garbage balloon. And we get our balloon inflated and sitting there on the ground and we're maintaining it and they can't get their inflator fan started. <laughs> so I walked over and said uh, pardon me Mr. Uh, Forbes, but it looks like you're having a little trouble with your inflator fan. Would you be interested in having us bring our fan over and help you get your balloon inflated? And he said that would be awfully nice of you. <laughs> so we did, and we got his balloon inflated. And I ran into it two or three times, and he thanked me during that time. About two years later, we're on a flight, Pan Am flight, from Frankfurt to New York. And one of the persons came up while we were ready to take off and said, you have Malcolm Forbes and his son Steve in first class today as, as dignitaries. Okay, so we go, about the time we head off past England and out over the Atlantic, I excused myself with the guys, the other two guys in the cockpit for a few minutes and went down, put my hat on, straightened my tie, and put a coat on, went down. And Steve and Malcolm were sitting there. I said, pardon me, Mr. Forbes, I don't know if you remember me, but I helped you get your Luna started in, uh, in Reno a couple of years ago. And he said, oh, yes. He said, you got a card? And I said, well, yeah, I do. So I gave him one of my cards. I got an invitation from him to fly at his chateau in France, Normandy, France, in a place called Malawa. And we did. I uh, got some friends. And we went over from England and flew there for a couple of days. The dinner we had in his castle has a motor around it and the whole works was unbelievable. There was about 400 of us in every room in the place, and there were two waiters for every person. And they would bring in hors d'oeuvre, two waiters, wine, and you would eat that, everything would go. A new set of serving would come, salad, and then everything would go, new wine every time. Went through all the way from all through that evening. But anyway, we had a great flight, and I, that was the last time I actually got to see him. But that was, that's my blooming experience. Okay, gliders. I didn't think much about gliders. What's the thing about going up, having the engine fail, and gliding back down on you know, the ground? We can do that in a powered airplane anytime we want to, and it usually scares us to death if it happens. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so I didn't think much about it, but I got talking to a guy on one of the flights down to Australia, and he said, oh, no, no, there's a lot more to it than that. The big thing about flying gliders is that you can go cross country, and you can stay up for long periods of time. It's soaring. It's not gliding, it's soaring. Soaring is using the riding, rising currents and so on. So I learned about a place called White Creek in, in the center part of Murray River, Australia. And when I had vacation, I went down there and went out and learned to fly gliders. And when I got there the first time, they said, well, we're going to have Sue Martin, Susan Martin fly with you and get you checked out. But I wasn't a glider pilot. And in, in Australia, uh, glider flying is controlled by the Glider Federation of Australia, not, not, not the government. And so I was like, well, I'm a big time pilot. I don't know if I want 
so the woman would come out and teach me how to fly. <laughs> Chauvin, being the chauvinist that I'm really not. But anyway, uh, Sue Martin comes out and we fly and we go out and get some good thermals, get up to about 10,000 feet. And she said, you do any aerobatics? And I said, well, yeah, I've done a few air, little aerobatics. And she said, well, let's do some aerobatics. So she did a loop, this is your turn. I did a loop, I did a spin, did a roll, about everything, and we finally worked our way down and landed. Did a couple more and she checked me out. Well, it turned out that Susan Martin was woman of the year in Australia because she represented Australia in international diving competition for women. She was so good at flying gliders, it is unbelievable. She was just outstanding. And she and her husband, Bob Martin, uh, became really good friends and I would go down and have dinner with them every year when they went down there for quite a few years. But anyway, that was my start. And they, they said after, uh, after a while, I said, well, real glider flying is going cross country. That's where you get the most fun and the most challenge. So I was working, they have various, they have silver, gold, and diamonds in, in, uh, in gliding. And they were based on altitude, distance, and, and duration of flights. And you carry a barograph on board which is sealed that proves what you've done and uh, that's the way that you prove your, your your flights and so forth. So anyway, the first one we did was, what I did was a little silver which is just out a little ways land and get somebody to tow it back up and, and come back. So that's fun. And then they said, well, if you're going to be a, a cross-country glider pilot, you will land out. Not that you may, you will. Because if you're going to challenge cross country, you're going to be conditions and situations where you're not going to make it back. So be prepared <coughs> to land out. So anyway, over a period of several years, I was able to get uh, the 300 kilometer flight in and then two 500 kilometer flights in when I was down there. And on one of the uh, 300 attempts, we had a little cloud deck move in and uh, the lift got worse and worse, and I'm struggling to try to keep up. We carry water ballast, anyway, as well. And I dumped the water ballast and, and uh, tried to make it back, and I knew I wasn't going to make it back. So I finally picked a farm and uh, landed in, a, in what they would call a paddock, a uh, little pasture area, not too far from the house, probably from here, 100 yards, something like that. So I landed there, and of course, that's making noise. And my now is his sun is just about setting. Just kind of a long deep shadow. And so I walked up the farm door and I could hear in the in the farm of the house rather, I could hear people talking. And they were saying uh, various things I couldn't understand very well, but I knocked on the door and I saw this big dark shadow coming against the screen door. I quit the see because of the light reflection who or what it was, but this big shadow was there. So I knew it was a person probably, and I said, um, uh, pardon me, I hate to bother you with, uh, when you're having you know, a good time and so forth, but I just landed a glider in your paddock out here, and I wonder if you would let me use your telephone to call the glider board up at White Creek so they can come with a trailer and, and uh, we can take it apart and pick it up. And there's this long pause over finding the screen door open a little bit, this huge hand comes out, grabs me away. The army says, you're a bloody yank. Come on in, yank, and have some yabbies. <laughs> yeah. The guy pulled me in. And yabbies are a freshwater crayfish. They're about like prawns, big prawns. They're great. And they were having a big bunch of them. And so there was about six or seven people there. They sat me down, have a beer, yank. Like, you know, nobody in the house for me without a beer. <laughs> so I said, well, this is wonderful. I didn't want to interfere. No, oh, no, we got plenty of yabbies, plenty of beer. Have some. So we sat there, and they'd ask me questions and going on and so forth. And I said, by now it's dark. I said, you know, you know uh, I really ought to make a call up to the glider port so they can start coming down this way, because it's 50 miles, you know, something like that, for them to get down here. 
And uh, they said, well, we don't have a telephone. <laughs> but don't worry about it. We'll run you over to the neighbors. Neighbors got a telephone. And I said, well, gee, that would be awfully nice. And then it goes on. Another beer, or oh, yeah, and the conversation goes on, and it's getting later. And I said, "Well, you know, they're going to be they're going to be a little bit worried about me up there at the glider port. I really ought to call. Maybe I'll just walk over to the neighbors." And the guy says, "I wouldn't do that if I were Yank. It's 25 months." <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, about midnight, we go over and get over to the neighbors and make the call. And they said, "Oh yeah, we weren't worried. We figured you out there somewhere." So 2 a.m. we're <laughs> they're loading the glider up. Obviously, I didn't get up too early the next day, but that was it. And then, just one other little quick tale on, on, uh, on that. What, what do we got until about 12.30 at least? Whatever you feel. Okay. When you get bored, just get up and leave. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, one day we came out, and it was a little bit overcast. And it was always cool. And the head of the, the guider program down there said, well, he said, there wasn't be much good uh, good soaring today because it's not going to get warm enough to get good thermals. And he said, uh, we, need a, we need a tow pilot. And he said, would you tow for us? And I said, well, I, yeah, I would be happy to tow for you, but two problems. I don't have an Australian, gliders, uh, an Australian pilot license. And secondly, I've never towed gliders. And he said, well, don't worry about the first one. So there's only one DAA, I think you call them DAA, DAC or whatever, inspector in this area. And uh, he's got a little or orange grove outside of town. And we tell him that if he makes, gives us any trouble, we'll all go out and pee on his orange, on his orange tree. <laughs> so he said, don't worry about the license. I said, well, okay. And they said, we're tell me to pipe a Pawnee. And I said, I've never flown a Pawnee. He said, he just flies like a big cub, except the wings are down here rather than up here. And he said, go out and fly it around the pattern. So I did, and I couldn't see anything when it came in. This, you got this really long nose out in front of you, and uh, I'm pretty short, and I was sitting down on this low seat, and I just kind of filled it down to the ground, got some pads after that. And I, so I told him, I did that several times for him. But, and uh, that was kind of interesting because here in this country, most of the time, you only tow one glider. Once in a while, I guess they tow, tow two. But most of the time down there, they tow two and sometimes three. And you tow off the side and low tie, high, high tow and so forth. And here you tend to, to steer the tow airplane, not there. You uh, just follow the tow airplane around and he gets you into a thermal. And what do you do if you're sitting in the glider, you'll see the tow airplane do this, and then you do this, and what you do want to do is when you're up here, you pull the release and then work that thermal. And so that, that's, if we have time, I'll tell you about thermaling and how you work the thermals and so forth. But let's go on to airplanes. Okay, so the Wrights used gliders as a way of proof of concept on their, on their controls and all the rest on airplanes, and they were way, way ahead of everybody else in terms of, of control systems. When they went to France, what is it, in uh, 1908 or 1909, they were so far advanced compared to the Europeans who could fly straight line most of the time, that was about it. They were just amazed how far advanced the rights were. But then World War I came along and technology just took off and it's continued to take off and it's gone from there. And I was fortunate enough to get involved in helping some friends. And the father of the friend had a bunch of airplanes down in New Mexico. And part of the process, he, he passed, but well, I actually had a stroke and eventually passed away. But I went down and helped him get uh, Curtis Robin that they had licensed and finished up. And we got it uh, somewhat certified. And in the process, my daughter and son-in-law went with me on one of the trips, and they were putting it up for sale, and they said, Dad, you got to buy that airplane. So I did. <laughs> and so I've been flying a Curtis Robin around uh, quite a bit. We were going to go on the National Air Tour with it in 1903, and I had an engine failure in Guernsey, Wyoming, fortunately right over the top of the airport. 
So I came down and landed on the airport and lost had the cylinder come completely off. And it, it sheared all the, the studs and it probably had been a hydraulic at some point. And what that means for those of you that aren't familiar with radio engines, oil tends to fill the bottom cylinders if it's released past the rings. And then if you don't get that out of there, when you try to start it, you have a solid liquid leak or solid liquid uh, space on top of the uh, of the cylinder. So that when the starter comes around and hits that, the piston comes up against that, just like coming up against a brick wall. And it puts a tremendous load on the studs that hold the cylinder onto the case of the engine. And so it had probably, that had probably what had happened sometime and weakened those studs, because all the studs sheared off on that one cylinder. Grad fortunately, I did it gradually. And I got on the ground and even taxied a little ways before it came completely off and fell off the ground. So anyway, we, have re we overhauled the engine and sent it down into California to one of the overhaul places there, and they totally rebuilt the engine. And we flew it all over the United States, been in uh, Midwest and, and uh, in uh, Oklahoma with it, and National Bible Plane Fly in it various other places, so we flew it a lot. And I had a good friend of mine, little lady that's about that tall, who flew bush pilots in beavers and, and uh, 185s up in Alaska. And I was trying to find someone to spell me off in, in flying, and I flew with a bunch of pilots in the area there. And she was by far the best best pilot. So Terry Sloan uh, would, uh, would fly with me, in fact, Somebody asked us one day, we went somewhere, and said, you two married? And Terry said, if I was married to him, I would have killed him by now. <laughs> so I think that says something about my personality, I'm not sure what. But anyway, we did that, but about three years ago, four years ago now, I was flying the airplane back from Ellensburg to Yakima, and it broke a connecting rod. And uh, I shut it down because it looked like it was going to catch on fire. There was so much smoke coming out of the exhaust and the fabric airplane catching on uh, a fire like that is not, not a good thing. And it would have been a, kind of an uneventful forced landing, but unfortunately I picked a field that had rocks and I big around it hidden in the grass and it ended up breaking up the landing gear and uh, scraping one wing tip. And so we're in the process of trying to get that repaired right now. And then we'll eventually get there, I think. If I live to 105, I'll get my all my projects done. <laughs> okay, but anyway, uh, I learned to fly, as I say, in a Piper Cub, and I did a lot of flying in addition to uh, everything else. And I had gone to, I was teaching, and I had uh, become part of the initial faculty at Big Bend Community College in Moses Lake that I completed a master's degree at the University of Idaho, and uh, so I taught physics and math there, and they decided after a couple of years of being at school that they wanted to get into some vocational programs, so I talked to them into starting a flight program and ended up head of the, the flight and EAP program at Big Ben, and then after a couple of years found out that the airlines were still hiring up to age 35, and I was 34, so I went to work for, I was going to go to work for, I thought for United, but I interviewed with Pan Am as well, and I told the chief pilot the fact that at Pan Am, I said, well, you know, I'll have to admit, I've got a, uh, they said at United that they would that, uh, put me on there, and he kind of leaned back in his chair and he said, young man, I was young then, he said, which would you rather do, have your layover in Peoria or Paris? <laughs> and said, that's a pretty good point. Yeah, <laughs> no, but I'd still rather Paris. Uh, and with Pan Am, I got to go everywhere they, they they flew except Berlin. They had a special group that flew in and out of Berlin. And I never went there, but I went all through Africa, all through South America. I think uh, there's two countries in South America. Uh, uh, all through Europe and, of course, the Middle East. Went to the Middle East every year, year after year after year, uh, to Tehran and, and, and uh, India and Pakistan and, and uh, uh, Lebanon and, and all everywhere through that region. And knew lots and lots of 
of people there. In fact, I got to tell you, the one thing that kind of bothers me is what's happening to uh, our Muslim friends because I found most of the Muslim people to be absolutely wonderful people. They treated me better than I've been treated by any group of people anywhere. And 99% of them are no more radical in their views than you or I or I. There's only a few, and I think we've probably got a few in this country that are radical that are not Muslim as well. But anyway, uh, I flew also then on the Pacific, all through the Pacific uh, area, Australia, New Zealand, and then uh, 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 Singapore and Malaysia, and I flew a lot of r and fights during the Vietnam War and out of Vietnam, and then to uh, uh, Bangkok and Hong Kong and, and into China itself and the, the, the cities there in Korea. So I basically everywhere Pan Am went, except and even including polar flights. We we had one uh, set of flights where they had had some kind of a fungus kill off most of the oysters in the Mediterranean, and so they found a variety that was withstand the fungus or whatever it was that was killing the the Mediterranean uh, oysters, and so we carried. 90,000 pounds of oysters on each flight, spat or juveniles, uh, from uh, Japan across the pole to, to France so they could restock their uh, oyster fields. So that was kind of interesting. We had to keep it very cool. And we could not keep the cockpit warm and keep it cool as well. So we had all the blankets and everything else wrapped around ourselves trying to keep warm and, you know, 40, 60 below uh, zero temperature uh, in those outside and so on. But anyway, that was kind of interesting. Uh, somebody asked me not too long ago, what was your most hair-raising experience with airlines? And I would say two. The first one was I was in Rome on a layover and supposed to go back the next day to New York. And they called us up the three of us on a crew, and they said, we need a crew to go to Tehran and pick up the Americans and Iranian employees. This was just after the Shah had been disposed and Ayatollah came into power, within three or four days. And then I, when they said, well, you know, we said, uh, is it safe for them? We think so. <laughs> and they said, they don't have anybody at the airport. It's just all confusion. You ought to be able to fly in there, pick up the, the uh, people and come back out. So we did. But it was kind of hair raising because we went in without any radio contact, didn't talk to anybody, there wasn't anybody to talk to, landed up on the Tehran airport without any radio contact except Pan Am uh, uh, operations there. And we loaded everybody we could get on uh, that airplane, 747, and brought it back out. And uh, they talked about a chair when they when we cleared uh, Iranian airspace, we said, well, we just uh, uh, cleared Iranian airspace into Turkey, and they uh, big cheer went up and so forth. So that was one. And that one wasn't too bad, because we were so busy to think about it. The other one was on a freighter flight, a 707 freighter flight from Anchorage to Tokyo. And on that particular one, they said, well, there's a typhoon approaching Tokyo, but you should get there about an hour ahead of the typhoon, so it should be a problem. And uh, so we're going to dispatch you to go there, and, and then we have the weather forecast and so forth. Well, this was pretty early on. This would be in the mid-70s, or maybe even late 60s, well, early, early to mid-70s. And so we launched out, and it turned out the headwinds across the Pacific were much, much stronger than the weather forecast. And we were an hour late getting into the Tokyo area. And we have now used up most of our reserve fuel. And it, just to give you an idea what you had to do, you had to have the fuel, not counting taxi and so forth, the fuel from takeoff to destination, make a uh, missed approach, go to an alternate circle for 30 minutes for a very frankly, at the alternate. That was your minimum fuel that you had to have. So, our alternate was close. That was, uh, uh, anyway, the, the military field there. Yeah. 
see it now. This is when they had the downtown airport in you know, Japan. By the time we got there, the storm had got there. And we made an approach into Tokyo, and we saw it go by at about a 45 degree angle in just heavy, heavy turbulence. So we pulled up and we asked for clearance to the military field. They said, it's closed, you can't go there. So we said, okay, how about Osaka? They said, Osaka's closed. I said, we're going to Osaka. And because the storm was moving that way. So we got a clearance to go to Osaka, direct to Osaka. And we did, and by the time we got there, it was still below minimums. We landed below minimums, but we were able to land. We had two engines flame out of our taxi, for lack of fuel. Now, it probably wasn't quite that bad, because on a you know, 707 or on most of jets, when you're sitting on the ground, the wings are like this. When you're flight, the wings are like this. So you probably had a little more fuel mm -hmm. in there, in the tank, than what it would show when you were on the ground. So we might have been able to make around the pattern one more time. Oh. But probably, that would have been the absolute maximum. Going around. That's close. So that's, uh, <laughs> that kind of makes the hair stand up in the back of your neck when that happens. So those are my, my, my two. We had a lot of funny ones too, but that was a two. They always tell the story, and I gotta tell one funny story. Back in the early days when they had movie uh, projectors in the center of the highway, and you all had headphones, and you'd sit there and watch the movie. They're flying across the Atlantic, they're flying somewhere. And they had a Doris Day Rock Hudson movie. And in this movie, there's a scene where they look at each other's eyes, and you can just see the love pouring out, and they finally embrace, and they separate, and Rock Hudson says something to her. I don't remember what it was, but he says something to her. Well, about the time there at this point in the movie, up in the cockpit, I'm not on this flight by the way, but I know the story very well. Somebody passed gas. <laughs> and it was smelly. Bad smelly. So they all grabbed their oxygen masks and put on their oxygen. <laughs> okay. When you get the oxygen mask, you have to push the button says it'll come. So you can talk to each other. Well, the captain reached down and he missed their cough and hit PA. <laughs> and when the movie's on, the PA overcomes it. And that's what you hear is the PA. And so as Rock Hudson separates from Doris Day, he says over the PA, that's got to be the worst onion fart I've ever seen. <laughs> So those things happen. <laughs> <laughs> helicopters. I don't have an awful lot of experience in helicopters. I've got a little over 100 hours. Well, just just 100 hours, almost right even at 100 hours. Enough to get the rating and, and so forth. And yeah, I was just perfecting auto rotation landings to a full, full touchdown. And they were, in fact, I had a lot of auto rotations from up away. They were, they were fun. <laughs> For the private, you had to do a straight ahead auto rotation. A rotor rotation is a simulated engine failure. And when you do, you trade altitude for speed on the rotor. And then you recapture that speed on the rotor as you're getting next to the ground to get you stopped and get you back on the ground. So you dump the collective and let the thing fall at a steep angle until you get close to the ground. And then you pull up on the collective pull back on the on the uh, on the on the stick so that you come in and set it down. So you're taking all that energy falling and getting it on there. And that was fun. Because you come down and you had to be precise. And then for the commercial you had to do it in a hundred and eighty degree turn. And they don't glide very far. Believe me, they don't glide very far. But it was fun. And the other thing that I found out about flying helicopters is, you know, in an airplane, you push forward to go down, you pull back to, to go up, pull back hard, you go down. That's a fast flight. Okay? Uh, in other words, you're going to stall out, probably. In a helicopter, you have rudder pedals. You can't scratch your nose, by the way. There's no way to do it. Uh, you have rudder pedals, and you have a collective over here, and you have a stick out here. This one 
is your direction. Go sideways, forward, go back, sideways, okay? This one is up and down, you rattle, throttle in, you roll it, and so forth. And then your pedals turn to be controlling the rudder in the back. Totally different than an airplane. So you gotta get used to all doing this. We used to say, you know, if you could pack your rudder stomach, you could pack your head, and jump up and down on one foot, and then reverse the whole works, then you're a piece of qualification for being a helicopter pilot. In fact, they say the most dangerous thing you can put in a helicopter is a high time fix one. <laughs> yeah. Well, what somebody else told me, a helicopter is nothing more than a collection of flights of parts flying in more or less close formation. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's my, my helicopter experience, but it was fun. And I, I was just starting to learn how to, to dry uh, cherry trees. And that's, that was kind of interesting because we'd fly down the rows at about three feet over the cherry trees after a rainstorm. The uh, rain will ruin the cherries because the moisture is absorbed into the cherry and they split. And then they're, they're colors. They're not good for anything. So you try to blow the, the rain off as soon as you can. You get the water off the cherries so they won't do that. Then what you do is you fly with the helicopter down about three feet off the trees at about walking speed down the rows. And then come around and you cover the whole orchard that way. The, the wash from the helicopter plays and, and then blows it, blows it off. And uh, I was just starting to learn that and, and say it's just about ready to go down and take the instructor uh, check ride and when the, uh, the owner of the helicopter service and his wife, who they had joint ownership, uh, decided that they had split the seat and, and get a divorce and that put the end of the the business, yeah, so it's no longer there. But anyway, actually there's a new helicopter service here in Yakima now, but uh, J&R. Anyway, so those are those are my four uh, areas. We could maybe see if there's any questions anybody has for a minute or two. You do Charlie McAllister? I do Charlie quite well. Now, yeah. I was, I'd never met him, but he had taught a friend of mine to fly when my friend was in high school. Uh, my friend is now in his late 80s. Yeah. But Charlie was still flying, obviously, up in yeah. the early 90s or just before he came Yeah, out. he was 96, I think. But I stopped by him. I've never been to his FBO. No. I'm going down, and this is before the data he was in the gym. Yeah. But, but I was going through photographs and magazines on a counter like a lot of FBOs have. And I ran into a regular case of some sort. I opened it up and there was Charlie's flight uh, license signed by Orville Yeah. Um, they were just laying there with a bunch of junk. But those, uh, they've got those and they're actual photocopies of the, of the original. Uh, the original, I think, is you keep it in the safe or somewhere, don't you? I'm not sure where it is, yeah. but it's probably up in the yeah. archive. You can I think it was, wasn't it, uh, the one on display is one that was a, a copy? Is that what it yeah, is? I think it is. This one, I think, might have been a real one, but it, it was laying be. on top of the counter. Yeah, if he was using it, it probably was. Yeah. 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 Well, why it, it those things, from what I understand, Orwell Wright was not his, he was like the national... He was president of the National yeah, Pilots yeah. Association at that time. And he signed virtually all pilot certificates in the early years. So it, it wasn't unusual if for any of the early pilots to have his signature because he'd signed most of it. Yeah, and but, it, but the, the number on it, I think, is like in the hundreds, isn't it? Yeah, it's low. Charlie I forget that. Like 119 or something yeah. like that. So he was, Charlie was what, the first or second pilot to land? Uh, second. Yeah. 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 Uh, Jefferson. Jefferson. Yeah. yeah. It was the first one? Yeah. I think that's right. Uh, I think that's what I read was the second. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, it was like a day difference. The other guy got up in the morning and beat him to the airport. Yeah. <laughs> I have uh, membership number one for the Calistry Museum. Uh -huh. So I, okay. I did a lot of volunteer work early on when they were uh, there uh, for him. And then I got involved with a bunch of other things and uh, haven't done as much. Uh, we had a little disagreement on Charlie left him quite a lot of money and unfortunately they had some early management that uh, kind of misused a lot of those funds and so they ended up a lot of the funds being 
uh, used up when they should have been pre reserved for rainy day and so on. They could have got enough money uh, just off the earnings to meet all of their fixed requirements every year if they had done it right. But anyway, that's, they're, they're doing very well. A couple doses here uh, now from there. And they've, they're expanding the building now. They've got another building out front. I never flew with Charlie. I took my first airplane ride there with one of my classmates who uh, did learn to fly there. And we flew one of the old Aronkas uh, out of there on a flight. That was just after I got out of high school. And, uh, but I learned you know, over at Bowling Field in Seattle. There was, show you how different the prices are. Three of us went together and bought a Piper Cup, 46 Piper Cup, Metal Spark Cup, in pretty good shape for $690, $230 a piece. And that was the most money I'd ever seen. The big bar was still to get $230 a piece. And, but we did, and then I uh, learned to fly in that, that, that cub. Eventually ended up buying the other two out, but I was a year ahead of and uh, started a teaching career and had a little bit of money. Four, yeah. four of the skydivers in the market. Pardon? Four other skydivers, and I bought a J3 Cub out of a fresh restoration in the early 70s for $3,000. Yeah. And it was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> we just finished restoring uh, this right here. And this one, uh, God, is part of it. It's, uh, you put a C85 uh, with a starter on it, in it, and uh, put wind tanks, stick out the nose tank, uh, have growth brakes, have uh, about almost every modification you can get, starting with bare tubing and sandblasting and powder coating and working up from there. It's been a three-year project, but we've, we've just finished uh, doing that. So that's, that was kind of a fun project. Uh, <laughs> somebody asked me, will you ever do spins? And uh, my instructor was one of these guys you couldn't finish a lesson without doing a spin. That was the last thing we did every every time before we headed back was do a spin. And so by the time I soloed, I could do three turn spins and come right on a, out on the heading, on a promenade, and he's been doing it every time. He didn't think anything about it. The first thing he said was, on the first day we went out, he said, let's do a 360 degree turn. Okay, a 360 degree turn. No. 360 degree turn is like that. <laughs> so we did a loop. And uh, I wasn't quite expecting that, but that's what we did. So I, you know, we did all that stuff all the time. And, and uh, never thought anything about it. Never thought about parachutes or anything else. I did all my cross country in one day. And I started when the sun was just coming up. Took off from Boynfield, flew over to Yakima. Flew back to Boyd Field, had a gas for it, and uh, then went from there down to uh, Pearson, and from Pearson out to Hope Rim, and Hope Rim back to Seattle, Seattle up to Bellingham, and Bellingham back to Seattle. When I got there, the sun was just at the horizon. Eight and a half hours, one day. So that's, I wouldn't recommend it, but that's how to get your, get your flight in fast. Again, any questions? Can you hear me all right back there? Okay. I try to talk loud, but sometimes I look at somebody close and I don't talk quite as loud as I should. Okay, well, what else can I, what other lie can I tell you? <laughs> there is a way, you know, well, <laughs> yeah, that's best. Shut up and quit. I'll tell you one more story. We have, at Pan Am, we had wonderful flight attendants. Most of them were European or non-national non because of the fact that uh, you had to speak, they had to speak two foreign languages besides English. Mm -hmm. And there weren't very many American kids that coming up through school that could do that. But we had a few. And one of them was a, a lady that I knew very well named Dorothy Kelly. And Dorothy had uh, been an art major in college, and she went to, went to Paris 
and study after uh, after school for a little while. She was she was there. I think she learned French and Italian or French and Spanish. I forget what. But she spoke three languages. She also had a, a ATP auto license and uh, with uh, with her husband later on operated a little commuter airline out of uh, New Hampshire. And uh, so Dorothy was a uh, a very attractive young, uh, lady, as well as being really nice. He ended up, she and her husband lived next door to me and my family out on Long Island for a while. So we got to be pretty good friends. I knew her real well. Well, all of you probably know of the Tenerife accident that happened between KLM and Pan Am, where uh, KLM 747 and the Pan Am 747 collided on the runway, and everybody on the KLM airplane was killed. And uh, most of the people on the Pan Am airplane were killed as well. And what had happened is there had been a bomb scare at, at uh, or a bomb actually went off at uh, Palma, the main airport. And so they diverted uh, the airplanes over to Tenerife, which is a secondary airport in the Canary Islands. And they had, it was foggy and they had to wait until they had got the airplane, airport to clean it off at the other one which they finally did, and then it was foggy, they had to wait a while. And KLM was anxious to get out because their their limits on time was running out, and if they didn't get airborne within a certain amount of time, they would have had to, mandatory by Dutch law, take crew rest, which meant they would have to stay there with their passengers. And they had their chief pilot, was a pilot on the airplane, and being a good company man, he was trying to push to get out. So they went out first. They had airplanes parked on the taxiway, so they had to use the runway to taxi on it. So they taxi down the runway, and they go off at the end, uh, near the end, and uh, make a 180 degree turn and come back onto the runway. Well, they went out, and then Pan Am was taxiing on behind them. The co-pilot was a very close friend of mine, Bob Bragg, in the Pan Am airplane. And they were taxiing down. And the control tower gave KLM permission to taxi in a position and hold. Uh, actually, the international is a little different than hold. And it's position and weight, I believe, is the international. It's a long known term. Why the Wait. But it, because it was a Canary Islander who didn't deal with it, the international flights quite often, he used some non standard phraseology, and I forget what it was, but he didn't quite say it and the international standard phraseology way. So the captain says we're cleared for takeoff, and both the co-pilot and the flight engineer said, no, we're not. Uh, we're, we're not. They said, yes, we are. We're going to go. Because they were down to about two or three minutes before they, they had to get airborne, but they had to cancel their flight. And they were, the other two were intimidated by the captain because he was their chief pilot and he was their boss. And so they, they didn't try to override it. And meanwhile, Pan Am is taxiing down the runway. They're not off the runway. So then the tower calls Pan Am and says, are you clear of the runway? And Bob was doing the communication work, and he said, no, we're still taxiing on the runway. And he looked up at that point, and he saw the KLM airplane, and he said, well, there's the end of the runway. But then he realized they were coming. And they were at high speed already. So he jammed the throttles, pulled forward, took the tiller, Turn the, they have steering tillers on each side on a 747, turn it full over to try to get off the runway. And all he managed to do was really get turned almost uh, crosswinds, but still on the runway. Said the last thing he saw was the number four engine coming right at the cockpit, right at his window. So he ducked and it cleared his head by inches, took the whole top of the cockpit off. The rest of the engine and the landing gear took sheared off the whole top of the Pan Am airplane all the way down to the main deck, took the whole upper deck off, and all the people that were up there. Dorothy Kelly was the second command purser on the flight, and she had just finished making an announcement in the lower level when the collision uh, uh, occurred, and she said she thought a bomb had gone off and blown the airplane up because it was that violent and so forth. The floor collapsed under her, and she fell into the baggage area, had to climb back up 
out of that. Well, they lost all their communication support and everything else. The, the captain raised up out of his seat to get up, and he did, his seat broke off, and he fell backwards out of his seat and landed on the cross on his back in a first class seat and then broke his back. And he crawled out of the airplane, uh, but he was using a good staff. And uh, Bob Bragg saw that happen, and he saw the flight engineer dangling in his uh, on his seatbelt behind him. So he slid the window. Well, there wasn't any windows. Oh, gone. He took the oxygen mask and jumped out over the side, holding on the oxygen mask, which would take him about halfway to the ground. You know, it's like jumping out from the ceiling up here, about that high. And he said he came down about halfway, and then it broke, and he fell the rest of the way. He ended up breaking his ankle, but didn't know it. You know, there was so much adrenaline and so forth. So he started helping try to get people out and away from the airplane. Dorothy climbed back out, and she was trying to get people out the, the door, and she got pushed out, and she fell off the ramp and fell onto the ground. And she got up, and uh, we're pulling people away from the airplane as it was burning. And eventually, the whole center part of the airplane exploded and went right over their heads. And so they only got a relatively few number of the people out. But anyway, they did, and they were very heroic. Dorothy had a very severe head injury, almost died. She was in the hospital there in Tenerife for about 10 days before they finally air evacuated her back to the United States. And uh, she was given very special awards and so forth for her bravery, so was Bob, and they, they saved a lot of lives. She had, though, in the meantime, after they got people away, had gone to the hospital and helped in the hospital with patients there, and finally one of the doctors said, you have a bad head injury, you gotta look at that. And they realized it penetrated through, through its stomach. And uh, so yeah, they got her stabilized, and that's why she survived. I, it, she was off in a year. And uh, it turned out we were doing a charter flight to Las Vegas, and we ferried an airplane, the 707, from, from New York to Pittsburgh, and stayed overnight, and then picked up a group bunch of gamblers and took them to uh, Las Vegas the next morning. And Dorothy was on the flight. And when we got to uh, Pittsburgh, she said, would you mind if we get together and talk a little bit? And I said, no, I'd be happy to. So we did, and we, we spent a, an hour or so visiting with each other, and, and uh, she said, I just don't know if I can do this. It just brings back so many memories. I, forget, I said I would try and so forth, but she said, I, I just don't know. She didn't last too long. She gave, decided that the career field would be better after that. But uh, she was a very historic lady. We had some others, too, that were like that. There was an Indian uh, lady that from India that saved a whole bunch of lives in a uh, hijacking in, in uh, the Middle East. Uh, they were getting ready to set off uh, charges in the airplane with the passengers, and she said, don't do that, stop, and so forth. And she interfered with them enough, they shot and killed her, but they didn't set the charges off. She, so she basically purposely interfered uh, enough to save that airplane and the people that were in it. We had a lot of people like that, and they were a really, really good bunch of people to work with. I, I'm <laughs> proud as could be that I could be associated with that kind of group. Anyway, that's my story. There you are. <laughs>